ministry wife is a vocation without a job description. And let's be honest, sometimes it seems like ministry might be easier if we did have one. If you are a ministry wife like me and are looking for hope, perspective, and a little bit of practical advice regarding your role, you're in the right place. Hi, I'm Christine Hoover, author of How to Thrive as a Pastor's Wife. Welcome to the Ministry Wives Podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. Join me as we hear from women from various ministry contexts, having authentic conversations about our shared joys and challenges, even the ones we're unsure we can talk about. No topic is off limits. My guest today is Ime Yang. I recently met Ime when I joined the staff at the Austin Stone because Ime is also on staff serving on the finance team at our church. Her husband, John, is one of our congregation pastors, and it's been amazing watching the Yangs use their influence to minister to our church. Ime is a first-generation American-born Chinese woman who has lived all over the United States. She and her husband, John, have been married for 20 years, and they have kiddos ranging from 16 to eight years old. John had a successful career in the corporate world for many years until God called him and Ime into vocational ministry. I asked Ime to share with us about that calling and how they navigated such a drastic change. Her story and their obedience is encouraging, and she shares insight here that we can all learn from when God calls us into an unexpected new season of life or ministry. Here, friends, is my conversation with Ime Yang. I'm so excited to get to welcome my friend Ime Yang to the podcast. Welcome, Ime. Thank you for having me. Well, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to my listeners, and then we'll tell how we kind of overlap and know each other. Sure, would love to. Well, my name is Ime Yang, and I'm married to John, who is a pastor at the Austin Stone. We have four kiddos. Um, Our oldest is 16, and then we have a 14-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a just newly minted 8-year-old. So it's a a busy house um, for us. Yes, and you also, John is serving at Austin Stone, but you also are as well. Can you tell us about your job there? Sure. So um, I work part-time at the church as well in the finance department, which I always kind of say with a little bit of a chuckle because it was not what I trained in in school, but um, where the Lord has me right now. So I I love it. It's great to kind of get to share in that way with John as well. So Yeah. So we overlap because we both serve at the Austin Stone. That's right. I want to make help the listener understand the way our church is formulated because it's a little confusing. As we talk, they might be confused of... Okay, so Ime and John are at this congregation, um, Christine and Kyle, we're at a different congregation, and you're serving in a, what we call a central role in the accounts payable department, so you're making sure we all get reimbursed, but um, do you want to help help the listener understand how the Austin Stone is formulated? Sure. So Austin Stone is based out of Austin, Texas. Um, It is a church, one church in six different locations. So we're spread all throughout the city of Austin. Um, John and I serve and worship at the St. John location, which is in a certain part of town. And then um, Christine and Kyle, they serve in the Northwest um, congregation. And so we kind of all do a lot of things centrally. It's um, a centrally led church um, in that there is a central directive. Um, we listen to the same sermons for the most part. We have the same programming. Um, but each location obviously has kind of its own flavor. Um, and so therefore its own pastors that kind of color um, and shape um, some local ministries that happen at each location. I work centrally, so there's kind of a central op- operations and communications team. We we office out of the same place. Um, and so, you know, all of the finances and all of the things um, that happen for, for those kind of things happen out of um, one team that happens to meet. So we serve all the different six um, locations. It's kind yeah, of, I think it's complicated. Be, but yeah. It <laughs> yes, it does work. It is a little confusing when I try to explain it to people. But I do get to see you uh, each week as I'm as I'm yeah. there in the central office. But I think one thing that I would love to know about for you is so John, your husband is what we call our congregation pastor at St. John. So he's leading that campus. And so when you engage the church, 
the people of the church, they know you not as the person working in the finance department. They know you as the congregation pastor's wife. (laughs) That's right. That's true. That's a lot to me. I think about that. And I think that's a lot of hats for you to wear within our church. So I'd love to know what that's like for you or what tensions you feel as you're wearing those different hats. Yeah. So you're right, Christine, in that like on a Sunday morning or at a women's gathering, um, you know, many of the women, unless we've had a conversation about it, don't know that um, I serve in this way. I mean, they may know that that's my job and that I work for the church, but uh, the work that I do for the church is so um, different than ministry life. Um, And so I, in general, don't feel a ton of tension because it is so set apart from kind of what usually happens when I'm interacting with partners at the church. Um, You know, usually when we're sitting around and we're um, at a women's gathering, we're not talking finance. You know, people aren't coming to (laughs) me and asking me like, (laughs) uh, right. They're not like, tell me about the budget that we're operating off of. Or um, so it's, you know, I get to speak about my job as any woman would get to speak about their job, you know, what, what it's like to get out of the door in the morning and to put on real people clothes and have adult conversation. That's, um, so I, you know, in, in general, as I talk about my work for the church, it's, it's kind of connecting on the points of what it's like to work part-time when, when you also have kids and, um, that kind of thing. So it's not really all that difficult to juggle the hat. I think it's actually more interesting to be in the office and be both John's wife and, uh, you know, work in my role. I hear a lot about what's going on in, in the broad skills and in the small skills. And so people talk about the St. John congregation and the finances that are affecting it or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, okay. You know, like I'll go home and be like, Hey, John, like, what's the story behind, you know? <laughs> the same yeah. happens for me because my husband is executive pastor at one of our congregations, so, but I'm working with people who are not at our congregation. So I do get to sometimes hear, it's an interesting spot to be on staff and be married to one of the pastor elders. Yes, for sure. <laughs> And um, that's not really why I wanted to talk to you today, though, because I really want to talk to you about you guys left the corporate world kind of mid-career to go into vocational ministry. And I think there, there, this is something that I've never talked to anyone about on my podcast, so I'm super excited to hear kind of the backstory of that. So let's just start with maybe telling us the story behind that switch. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, let me just preface it with the switch kind of came out of nowhere, but at the same time, as we look back, we can see how the Lord has prepared us for it for um, for a long time. And so to go way back in the story, when John and I first met, kind of one of our first connecting points that made us go, hmm, about one another, um, was our desire to one day be able to serve in full-time ministry. So, um, John okay. had exited from college and really wanted to step into youth ministry. He had been serving pretty heavily in a volunteer capacity, um, back then and was considering strongly just going in that direction. Um, but his dad is not a believer. His mom passed away when he was young. And so, um, his dad wasn't a believer and basically was like, if you do this, you're no longer my son. I mean, there's a lot of cultural undertones with that. Um, and so John, you know, prayerfully decided to honor his dad and, um, and didn't take that position and stepped into, you know, work in the corporate world. And so I knew this about John's story. I grew up um, with Christian parents and um, in the church and had, you know, my parents have always served really faithfully. Um, My dad is an elder and all the things. So had kind of grown up um, seeing what life, uh, what serving looks like. Um, And so I was always very open to that for a time. I thought I was going to be a missionary. I kind of was thinking um, in my previous life, I was a physical therapist. I thought I would be using that abroad or in underserved areas in the States. And so that was always kind of on my heart. And so we had this conversation really early on in our relationship about someday wanting to do this. But, um, you know, as life would have it and as the Lord led, we kind of were swept into kind of the corporate world, if you will. And so John was working and had worked 
corporately for over 20 years by the time we did um, step into full-time ministry. So, um, you know, I think we kind of still knew that that was something that was down the road, but I think we started thinking, oh, someday when we're empty nesters, you know, we, we might um, go and serve as missionaries or we might figure out a way to do this more vocationally. But um, it had kind of been a dream that got sh- shoved a little bit in, in the background, to be perfectly honest, especially for John. And so um, when this opportunity came up was when we were um, in Chicago, John was working in his dream job in aviation. He had always wanted to do this. He had um, was working for a big airline at that time, getting to do really, really neat stuff and just really in his element. And um, we had, but personally in our marriage and in our family life had started to have some, you know, harder conversations about what work-life balance would look like. Um, He was working all the time and traveling a ton. And at this point we had three young kids and um, I was, I was feeling like we, we were, we were missing, we were missing it a little bit. Mm. I, I said to him at one point, I was like, you know, I feel like the house is burning down and you don't even know it. Like, I need you to be like, we need to be able to be on the same page in terms of what life is supposed to look like and what it looks like to, um, to do this together. And so, um, you know, we were involved in church, we were serving, we, you know, he loved the Lord as did I, but I think we were just kind of missing it a little bit. So, um, one of his very good friends, uh, came out to visit us and he, was like, John, you know, the church is looking for a communications guy. They very specifically want someone who's come out, like who is outside the church, um, who's coming in with corporate um, experience. Would you consider it? And to be honest, John like laughed at it. He was like, what? You know, like me leave my dream job. And uh, so he, he didn't take it too seriously. But when he told me, I said almost immediately, I was like, I don't know that we can dismiss this um, wholeheartedly. And it's like, you never know. You have, you have made a covenant with the Lord years and years back that you would give your life to him in full-time ministry. And we thought it was going to look one way, but what if this is it? Mm. And um, because John loves the Lord and, um, you know, submits to him. We started praying over it, and uh, it was a very slow, slow process. I mean, it was uh, six to six to nine months before, like, from the time that we learned about the job to when we made the decision to do it. And um, so, it was a process of what it of surrender and kind of the Lord peeling back layers of, um, what we really like, what we say we believe and what we mm-hmm. really believe. Um, and so, you know, what, what cinched it is we finally came, he had come to Austin a, a handful of times to meet with leadership and to have conversations about what they were looking for. Um, but the very last time they, they flew our family in, cause I was like, we, we've worshiped at this church maybe twice when we have visited yeah. our friend. Like, we don't even know we're not just saying yes to a job. We're saying yes to a church and That's to a right. church family. And, yeah. um, so we came down as a family and we were sitting, you know, we had come in like midweek, like Thursday. And so Sunday was going to be our last day. And, uh, Saturday night we were sitting there and he's like, what do you think? I was like, I I I have no idea. I mean, we like, I, I, you know, I think we were just praying for like the skies to part and for the, you know, voice from the, from the heaven saying, and you shall take this job, you know, and we hadn't gotten that kind of confirmation yet, but we went into worship and, uh, the closing song was Jesus is better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the bridge is, you know, and all your sorrows and all your comforts and all of your treasures, like in all of these things, Jesus is better than all of those things. And would you make my heart believe it? And as we didn't know the song, it was new to us, Mm -hmm. but as it was sung over us, John just started weeping (laughs) and I look over and I'm like, oh, we're taking the job, you know, like we're, (laughs) we're so coming. And I think for us, it was just a question of do we believe that Jesus is better? Mm -hmm. Like this was John's dream job. He had approval of his dad, which is something that he had wanted for a long, long time. And, um, you know, we were financially in a really great spot. We had a great 
you know, house and we had children that on the surface looked like normal, wonderful human beings, you know, and um, I think from the world's perspective, we had, we had made it. And, and yet um, when it really came down to it, did we believe and, and trust that Jesus is better than that? Mm -hmm. And, um, and for us, the answer to that was then we needed to relinquish it. And I want to be careful to say, I I don't think that that's always the case. I don't think that, you know, to love Jesus more and to say that he's our Lord and Savior always means a yes to ministry. Right. But in our case, it was very clear that that was what he was asking of us. Yes. Um, And so we, um, you know, we stepped into it and uh, had so much peace about it. And um, here we are. Here we are. You know, almost a decade later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for making that clarification at the end, because I think that's absolutely true. Sometimes God would have us lay down ministry to go into the corporate world. So absolutely. Um, but for y'all specifically, he's called you. I'd love to talk about you, you brought up some things that I want to dig in deeper. One is the internal wrestling and one is the uh-huh. external pressure or the relational sure. like pushback. So one, let's start with the internal pressure. What were some of the things that you were having to count the cost of? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, for, I can speak for myself and then I can speak for John, I think, because in some ways I think the internal wrestling of cost was greater for him um, because he was in a job that he loved so much. It wasn't that he was dissatisfied. It wasn't that he was like, he had felt like um, a stirring that this wasn't what he was supposed to be doing. Um, In his mind, this was the job that he was going to retire with. Mm. Um, So um, I think for him, the wrestling was, um, the laying down of a, a dream that mm, he had yeah. had, and then the Lord gave him, and he was living out, and then asking him to pivot on what that dream was going to be. Um, for me, it was more, um, I was a little bit more, um, in some ways, prepared for it because I had been praying um, for the Lord to just um, help us establish a rhythm and a, and a family. Um, what am I trying to say? I felt like, like I said earlier, like for our family, John was, um, very present as a dad and I knew he loved us very much, but I didn't feel like the pace that we were living was sustainable. And so the conversations and the prayers about work-life balance to me, I was like, Lord, is this like, is this part of your answer for this Mm. um, specific prayer that we had? And I had to some extent always been somewhat prepared to have a shift for our family. Like I, John felt like he was living the dream. I don't know that I was feeling like I was living the dream. Um, And so um, I don't know if that makes sense. I, but I think that the internal wrestling was a lot of change. Like we had, Um, it's not, I'm not someone who enjoys change. I'm not a very adventure forward, like (laughs) always needing something new type of person. I like to settle in and be like, ah, this is my comfort spot. So Uh the idea of moving again and um, moving to a new city to join a church, I mean, it's intimidating to um, join a church that you don't know. We knew a lot about the Austin Stone, and it's uh, we have, like I said, good friends who who went there, and so we and we had seen life change in them. So I felt a lot of um, peace about it being a solid church, but you never really know um, what it's going to be like, and if you'll fit in there, and if uh, we'll get the culture of the church, and um, obviously to have a big change. Um, for John in terms of, in our family, in terms of what uh, pay, what life would look like with him working. Now, when he first started the stone, it was a central role. So he was um, overseeing all of the communications and social and all that. So it, it was an easier transition in that it wasn't that he was going to the Austin Stone to become a pastor. Right. Like, I think that that would have shocked our system a little bit more. And honestly, I, I think we would have been like, <laughs> us? No way. You know? Really? Um, Oh my gosh. I totally see y'all doing that. (laughs) 
that's well, funny. that's kind, but yeah, I mean, that, and that's the whole nother story on how the Lord kind of, um, worked us into that uh, or worked John into that. But so that was kind of the thought process of, are we really going to do this? Like we, are we really going to move? Are we really going to leave? And we had established a community um, yeah. in, in Chicago as well. So, mm-hmm. Uh, moves are never easy. Mm -hmm. I love that you're bringing up for someone leaving the corporate world, you're bringing two parts of your life together into one. So for pastor's wives, that's very natural for us. We all our lives, if we've been in ministry with our husbands, church and work have gone together, but, but you're marrying two things where church is where you work. And that, that's a huge change to bring those two things together. Let's, I want to talk about that a little bit later. Some of the maybe challenges you face with that, but let's go to the external pressure. Cause you've mentioned, you Mm -hmm. said earlier that John's um, and I don't know for you, if you would say the same, but your, your Chinese heritage came into play yeah. or your cultural yeah. heritage came into play in the decision with his dad specifically. Can you tell us more yeah. about that? Sure. Um, so John and I are both Chinese. Um, I was born here in the States. Uh, so my parents came, um, to study. My dad came for college. My mom came for graduate school. And so, um, by the time my sister and I came along, they had been in the States for a, a few decades. And so I was raised with like, uh, like we spoke Chinese in our home, but my parents also fluent in English. They worked, you know, jobs. Um, they were both chemists, which is really nerdy and, and funny um, at the same time. But so I and like I said, my parents are believers. So I was raised in a Christian home, but still there is always these kind of cultural undertakings of like, there's a a lot of academic achievement. I think by nature, the Asian cultures tend to be a lot more works based, um, where you, you hustle and you, you earn your way into the things that you have for John. Um, it was a little different. He was born in Taiwan, um, and his dad came first to try to pave a way for his family to come. And so, and his dad came to work. So, um, his dad, uh, you know, it's the very quintessential immigration, um, story, right? He came to the U S because of the promises of a better life and, uh, for his children. And so he came and he, um, started a business. His parents owned a grocery store in Houston in Chinatown. And so he grew up, um, very much under, and they, you know, weren't believers. So very much under the idea of you have to work to make it here. And I, you know, I have get his, you know, from his parents, like we have given up much, we have left family, we have hustled, we have, you know, gritted our way out to make a way for you and your sister to be able to enjoy kind of the spoils of this better land. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, anyway, amongst Asians, like doctors and lawyers and, um, you know, engineers, these are the coveted, uh, the coveted professions, right? So um, these are the ones that parents like to brag about. And, you know, we're, you know, my, my son went to X school and is now, um, you know, working as a doctor at MD Anderson or whatever is kind of the, the dream of kind of having made it for, um, for his dad. And so it was hard anyway, that John went into, um, advertising and communications like that was never a super understood profession by his dad. His sister is an engineer and then went and got her MBA. And so um, I think John always felt a little bit unseen by his dad. Um, John did very well in his career, but I think um, it was kind of like, it was not something that his dad ever bragged about or spoke as if he was proud of. And so um, there is uh, when, (laughs) and his dad is not a believer. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, when John was right out of college and wanting to go into ministry, his dad flat out was like, you cannot do this. Um, He, you know, would, you wouldn't expect a non-believer to understand the, um, the reason why you would say yes to, um, a job that pays a lot less, um, and 
you know, he, he wouldn't, we don't hold it against him for not getting why that would be um, a calling. Like he, he wouldn't have the context um, or the Holy spirit to, to inform him otherwise. And so when we were thinking and praying through this job, now this is fast forward many decades. I mean, John's much older, he's married, he has a family. And so his dad, I think knew from the get go, like his, his role or his influence in his son's yeah. life is very different than yeah. a fresh college grad. Um, and so we didn't go into that conversation as if asking for permission, but more in um, like, this is what we feel like the Lord. And we just spoke it as if we would to anybody else. Like, this is where we feel the Lord is calling us. And um, we, you know, we're planning on saying yes to it. And his dad had a lot of concerns. You know, he, <laughs> he also had the benefit of now having my parents who are believers who, you know, are equally vested in similar ways of their children's, you know, well being. And so he called my parents, you know, almost like right after we wow. hung up the phone with him. Okay. And, um, and my parents were really great in being able to just lead and be like, you know, we know that the Lord has got them. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you don't need to be afraid. Like they, they will be okay. Like all of the concerns of finances, um, like they were just like, we don't know the answers to that. Like we don't have a guarantee that they're, you know, and obviously this will mean some change, but you don't need to fear. Like the the Lord is not going to call them into something and not provide for them in the way that they need to be provided Mm -hmm. for. And so he, um, you know, we weren't necessarily asking for blessing in that dad, is it okay? But um, he also, you know, accepted it, I guess Mm. is the best way to say it. And it's been a really neat thing to see the Lord um, use kind of John's job and the stories that he gets to share. And um, it was especially, uh, it was very special when his dad came in, when John got ordained as an elder um, and he came in for it. And I think it was the first time that he kind of got a taste of, oh, this isn't just a job. Oh. Like he, he didn't, he wouldn't have been able to say what it was, but he felt, I think the first time the weightiness and the calling that kind of comes along with uh-huh. um, stepping into ministry in this way. And so we had a really great conversation that night at dinner. My parents were here too. And got to share the gospel again with him and just talk about how, you know, the world will offer these things that are, are shiny and bright and seem to be what, what we want and what we need. And yet um, what the Lord offers is, is different and better. Mm-hmm. Um, That's so, so it amazing. was a really neat yeah. experience. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I'd love to talk about just you kind of on that cusp of we're going to take this job. And I think one of the things that a lot of women in your situation would think about is this is going to change our financial situation. Um, yeah. So I'd love for you to talk through that. Like what was some of your thought process mm-hmm. about, about finances? Yeah. So, I mean, in general, I, um, if you were to say, you may like, what's your view on money? I would say that I, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of one of those people who, um, for whatever reason, whether it's um, just upbringing or nature, um, operate sometimes out of a um, a scarcity mentality. Mm-hmm. Even though I've been well provided for, so even when we were in Chicago, I. I never, like, we didn't ever adjust our lifestyle like, oh, we've like so made it, you know, like John's salary increased when we moved out to Chicago because he was, you know, got promoted and was in um, for his position and whatever. But I don't feel like we, in general, I look at money and I'm like, now I have much, so I will spend much. Now I have little, oh no, like I'm going to spend little, like I, I feel like in general, um, I'm, I'm the saver in our family. If that, you know, John's kind of more the spender and I'm, I'm the saver. And so I've always kind of been like underlying. It's always been something that I feel like the Lord has used to say, trust me, even in times of much and in times of little, I I feel like that's always my position of like, um, just trust me. Like I, I have what you need. And on the other hand, I, 
I'm not, I, it's funny because I work in the finance department, <laughs> Christine, but I don't handle our family finances. You know, John is the one that's always um, handled and managed our budget and, and, you know, handled all the day-to-day things with our finances. And so um, I say that to say, I, I think that as I, as we prayed through what this would mean, we knew it would mean changes. We had three, we had three kids and then we uh, added a fourth when we moved here to Austin. We, you know, the Lord surprised us with that one. And so there are for sure moments where I'm like, goodness gracious, Lord, we have four mouths to feed. Um, That's four times the number of activities that I wish we could do. And um, for every trip, that's six plane tickets, or it means we have to rent a minivan or, Mm -hmm. you know, there, we, you know, someday our kids will be big enough that we can't just have them sleep on the couch. And so we might need to get two hotel rooms wherever we, you know, so there are for sure those like practical thoughts of um, all of that, not to mention college. Like, yes. Lord, we would like to be able to set them up for success so that they don't come out of college with like buried in debt. And so there's like planning that needs to happen. But at the same time, there is just always the sense of um, it may not be what everyone else around us has or can do, but it will be good. Like the Lord will provide what is good. And so I think that as I think about money and as we thought about it back then, um, we we knew it would mean changes. I don't think it was a huge sticking point. Like it, I mean, the very crux of like kind of what we made the decision on was, is Jesus better? Mm-hmm. Like, is he is he better? Are we saying that he is greater than these things and the fears that we have? about potentially being able to provide for our children someday. Is he greater than that? And if our answer is yes, then we don't need to spend um, too much present energy fearing what might come down in the future. Yeah. That's so good. You keep referencing this song. I love that song. So I'm going to link to it for everybody to listen to. It's It's an Austin Stone song, I think. Yeah, it Um, is. Yeah. It's so good. So we'll link to it. Uh, for everybody to listen to. I think that what you just said is a good word for every pastor's wife who, whether they're, they know, they knew corporate world or not is just God provides for us. And he, mm-hmm. he, he's a good, he's a good shepherd. He provides for his, his flock. One of the things that I've been thinking about as we're having this conversation is that it's such a unique thing that you and John bring to your ministry at the congregation you're serving because you know Mm -hmm. what it's like to be in the corporate world. And when you were talking about work-life balance, I think sometimes as pastor's wives, if that's all we've known, we can think, oh, my husband, he, he has so much on his plate, which is true. They do. They do work a lot of hours. But sometimes we can lose sight of that the people who are coming to church on Sunday they are experiencing mm-hmm. the same thing and could be, it could be even more. And yeah, they, I heard a pastor say once that um, when people come to church, they are so thirsty for truth and grace because they've been mm-hmm. in the workplace all week. That was a good perspective for me to think about yeah. serving them. And so I just am thinking y'all, y'all bring a unique perspective. And I'm wondering how that has, how does that affect how you minister to the people at St. John uh, in terms of, you know, what that's like to be in the corporate Mm -hmm. world? Yeah. You know, I, I think that that's, um, it is, you know, as it is for all of us, like the Lord, when we think about the experiences and, and the trials that he um, puts before us, he, he never wastes it, never. right? Like it's not just meant for, and it's not just meant for our own personal sanctification. It's meant for the building up of the body. Yes. And, and so I think, um, I think that that is such a beautiful thought when I, when I think about um, the story that the Lord has written for us in the way that God does use that in the way that um, John is able to minister to um the flock that he's been entrusted with. I think that um, it, 
it really bridges the gap sometimes in the conversation of what does it look like to live a life that's surrendered um, for, for him to be able to say, Hey, these are the ways that I struggled in, in an environment that is like yours. And these are the ways that I still struggle with it in an environment where you would maybe assume that I don't, but I, I still do like some of the same um, temptations are, are present Mm -hmm. just because he works in ministry. Like this, there are many of the same struggles that um, he faces that I face. And so um, it is, it is one of those things of just laying down a story of being willing to um, speak vulnerably about um, what what the Lord has walked us through and where we struggle with it, and kind of even in the present moment, um, what does it look like to live a life that is um, surrendered to the Lord? Whether yeah. it is the laying down of um, of wants and desires, or um, trying to pray through establishing good boundaries of work-life balance, or what does it look like to fight for your marriage? What does it look like to engage with your kids? And all of those things, um, we see how the Lord has kind of been using the things of our past and in the ways that we have massively failed. Um, and, and also some of the victories that have been sprinkled along the way to kind of inform how we live now. Mm-hmm. Um, So I'm really grateful. I've seen John really be able to use um, his prior experience and his um, his just what was it like to kind of in some ways have it all, and then yeah, Yeah. um, but but then realize oh I don't I don't have it all if I don't have Jesus in the midst of that. That's awesome. Well, just to close, I would love for you to just speak to women listening who maybe their husband did come home. And say, I mm-hmm. think I think God might be calling <laughs> me to something else, or maybe they yeah. feel like you, where you kind of saw it first. And mm-hmm. uh, what would you say to women who are kind of like God might be me moving us into a different, an unexpected season of ministry? Yeah, yeah. Um, goodness, I I would just start with saying um, I am so grateful whenever the Holy Spirit moves. In, in just even an inkling that happens between um, me or John, because it, it's just sweet confirmation that I'm his, right? I never want to be stagnant in times when I'm dry in the word or when I'm, um, you know, most of the time for me, it's going to be, I my pattern is more towards complacency than doubt. But um, when I'm dry and then the Holy Spirit brings like an idea that feels, even if it feels like it rubs, I'm like, thank you Lord for the reminder that I'm yours. Because if I weren't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recognize that for what it is. And so the first thing I would just say is, um, just pray. I mean, there, I, I can be uh, guilty of thinking about things a lot. I'm a thinker <laughs> Me too. Uh, over a feeler. Um, and so I can think that I'm praying, but I'm really just yeah, thinking. That's right. Um, but praying and laying it before the Lord and just asking him, um, with open hands, I think is the biggest thing at Lord, where, where am I? Like, I, I want to be surrendered about it, but where are my hands still clutching on? Like, you know, where are my fingers still needing to be peeled back? What are those pain points? And would you, would you help me in the midst of those things? I think I can be hard on myself when I realize that I have those things. And, um, and yet to recognize that that's part of what the Lord wants, like he's always chasing after our hearts. And so the answer or the decision is really secondary to the, what he really wants, what he really wants is my heart. Mm -hmm. What he really wants, like he, you know, God could do his work just fine without John and I at Mm -hmm. St. John. Um, He doesn't need us specifically, but in his grace and his mercy to us, he has called us to do that. And so why? Because he also is chasing after our hearts Mm -hmm. to be fully his and to um, grow our affections towards him. And so for me, more and more as kind of, um, you know, we're not facing a big kind of career type decision right now, but in, you know, as we face 
tons of decisions every day as anyone knows like um where where we're supposed to go what where am i supposed to send my children for school and all these decisions i i always just come back to what is the what is the ultimate aim in all of this and the ultimate aim is that um I would be his child. That's mm-hmm. what he wants. He wants me to be his child and for my heart to be his. And so um, prayer is the best way to allow him to impact and to inform my heart of, of his heart. And praying together with your husband um, and asking for the Holy Spirit to give confirmation through unity. He's he's not going to call one of you in a direction that he is not going to bring the other along with. Um, and I, I've had to learn that that doesn't always look like equally matched levels of excitement or <laughs> readiness, uh-huh. <laughs> right? Um, because oftentimes, um, I, I would say most oftentimes, like one of us is lagging in, in that. If I were to look at like, am I as ready or am I as excited? Um, then, then I would be in trouble, but it's more, am I as called, mm-hmm. you know, it, 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 do I feel at peace with this? And the Holy spirit is like, God is a, he, he is unified in his being. And so in the way that he works and he moves, he moves in unity. He does not move in chaos. And so, um, Praying for unity of spirit is is a really important um, thing, and I was, you know, I'm really blessed. John John knew that from the very beginning. He was like, I I will not go unless you also feel called to go. Like this is not one of those things where it's like I'm just taking a job. Like we're stepping into something completely mm-hmm. new, um, and so we really prayed along those veins that the Lord would. Um, that he would affirm his will in us, that he would, he would confirm it for our hearts, for our benefit through unity, um, in, in just the decision. And so, um, and just, I, you know, whether you're someone who loves change or doesn't love change, like, uh, just seeing it as an opportunity as what the Lord is after is just for me to, to like be reminded once again of what life is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the step-by-step with him. And on purpose, he didn't give us a roadmap. I wish he did, but I know. Um, that'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. Well, thank you, Ime. This has been so, I just have been so encouraged hearing your story and getting to see you in real life in action and seeing how God, I love how you said he doesn't waste anything. I totally believe that. I've seen it in my own life and I see how he hasn't wasted what your previous, quote unquote, previous life was. Uh, he's using it here at Austin Stone. So I'm so thankful for you joining me today. Thanks, Christine. Thanks for listening to the Ministry Wipes podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. I would love to hear from you. We are creating an episode full of our listeners' funniest or most embarrassing moments in ministry. Record and send your story to me at the link in the show notes. And don't forget, if you found this content helpful, please rate and review us on your podcast platform or share it with a friend. You can find this podcast and other helpful resources at ministrywivespodcast.com.